It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This year's budget is only days away, and the Ontario PC Caucus is looking for a few assurances. Liberal scandal, waste and mismanagement have led to hydro bills that have skyrocketed in our province. Energy is now unaffordable, and many vulnerable seniors and families simply can't afford their hydro bills. Therefore, this budget must include a credible plan to make energy affordable in Ontario. And any credible plan must include halting the fire sale of Hydro One. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier appreciate that any budget without a House plan for affordable energy will be viewed as a failure to all those seniors, families and businesses across Ontario Question. struggling with a Liberal hydro mess? Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And once again, let me welcome Lauren Coe to the Legislature. We look forward to uh, working with him. Welcome, Lauren. Um, Mr. Speaker, you know, in, uh, in 2003, we were elected on a, a platform to deliver clean, modern, reliable electricity in this yeah. province because there wasn't clean, affordable, yeah. reliable yeah. electricity in this province, Mr. Not Speaker. There were huge investments needed yeah. to invest. There was an artificial cap that had been put on the price of electricity, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that created huge problems down the road. And uh, I would say to the uh, Leader of the Opposition that I hope he acknowledges acknowledges that uh, the investments that have been made in our electricity system, Mr. Speaker, mean that it is clean, mean that it's reliable, Mr. Speaker, mean that thousands of kilometres of line have been upgraded, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. It's coming from all sides. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we did make a decision to uh, take the whole province off coal, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. There's a cost associated Thank with you. that, but we have that clean, reliable power that we need. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and, and let me say that scandal, waste and mismanagement is not code for investments. Right. This government must be looking at ways to make electricity and hydro bills more affordable. Just, just look at the story Minister that I read of Natural recently Resources. of the Blenheim resident Kathy Van Breda. I recently read her story in the Chatham Daily News. She is a 74-year-old widow. Her last hydro bill was $813. She said that was $500 more than what she usually pays. Mr. Speaker, does this government understand that their scandals, their mismanagement, their waste means higher hydro bills for residents like Ms. Van Breda? Will the Premier apologize to Ms. Van Breda? Will she apologize for this atrocious bill because of your government's incompetence on hydro? <laughs> Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would hope that the uh, that the member for that uh, citizen of Ontario would make it clear to her what the programs are that would help her with her electricity bill, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize we recognize that investing in our the member from Leeds Grenville and the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Mr. Speaker, there, I have said quite clearly there are costs associated with investing in a system that had been neglected and degraded, Mr. Speaker, by a previous government. Those costs, Mr. Speaker, have, uh, have meant that we have now got a system that is reliable, that is clean, Mr. Speaker. We're ahead of the curve in terms of a clean electricity. Well, I, 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 I will move right to uh, members directly. Uh, and my next warning will be I will move to warnings. The member from Simcoe Gray will come to order, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. I would say to the Leader of the uh, Opposition, if he is suggesting that we should go back to coal or we should subsidize and create more debt, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to do that. That artificial cap that was put on by the previous government, the burning of. The member from Glengarry Prescott Rusk just chirped one too many. I'm now moving to warnings. You have 10 seconds. 
Mr. Speaker, we are not going to go back to burning coal. If that's what the Leader of the Opposition is suggesting, we're not going there, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. That in the campaign. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier, the voters of Whitby Oshawa didn't buy that smear either. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? It was Premier Ernie Eves who announced the phase out of coal. So don't try any of these diversion tactics. The reality is, this is because of your. Just to make sure the members understand, at any given time, you will get a warning. When it gets too loud by everybody, I'll stop. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, we've obviously touched a nerve. The Liberal government doesn't want to talk. This is their fault. They must own up to it. The Auditor General said very clearly it is because of your mismanagement. So let's go back to what this is about. This is about seniors across the province who can't afford their bills because of your political interference in the energy sector. So Ms. Van Breda, she has done everything possible to lower her bill. She doesn't turn the TV on till the late afternoon. She keeps no lights on during the day. She actually Question. she cleaned up her attic to put insulation in, and it's still $800. Will you apologize to the seniors in this province? Thank this you. is because of you. This is because of you. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. The Leader of the Opposition is saying we should not have invested in those lines around the province, those uh, transmission lines, Mr. Speaker. We should not have upgraded the system. We have, should not have continued to shut down the coal-fired plants, Mr. Speaker. We should not have a clean, renewable electricity system, Mr. Speaker. And the Leader of the Opposition is suggesting either, either that we return to coal, burning coal, or, Mr. Speaker, that we do, as a previous Conservative government did, put an artificial cap on electricity prices, which will actually increase the cost to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So, I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, we have a plan. He knows full well that the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One, which will allow us to invest in infrastructure, has nothing to do with electricity prices. If the last episode was a test, I will pass the test and warnings will be distributed. New question. The, uh, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For years, it has been clear to us on this side of the House how damaging your government's reckless and dangerous energy policies truly are. The phone calls to my office and my colleagues' offices just haven't stopped. We hear from constituents every day who are desperate for help because they can't afford their hydro bills. Many people in Ontario don't know how they're going to pay this month's bill. Yep. Speaker, why does this government stubbornly refuse to do anything to make energy more affordable in Ontario? Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, I hope when those uh, people call his office that the member opposite is very clear with them that we do understand that there are challenges. We do understand that there was a cost associated with shutting down the coal-fired plants, that there was a cost associated with making a degraded electricity system a reliable electricity system, Mr. Speaker. And so that's why we have removed the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have put in place the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, Mr. Speaker, which is targeted particularly at seniors, Mr. Speaker, to allow them to reduce their electricity costs. We've put in place the Low Income Energy Assistance Program, Mr. Speaker. We put in place the, the Northern Ontario Energy Credit, Mr. Speaker. We've made it very, very clear that there are mitigating programs, Mr. Speaker, to deal with the costs. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we had to have a reliable, clean energy system that was not left by the previous government. Thank That's you. what we've built in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. It's just a rolling shell game. You know, your former minister, George Smitherman, said that Green Energy Act was going to cost 1% a year. Yep. 
That's where the costs have gone. The auditor says $9.2 billion more than it should have. This government's out-of-touch response is more than just a mere band-aid for the gaping hole that is skyrocketing hydro bills. It's not just families and seniors in this province, province that are struggling to pay them. As hydro prices rise in Ontario, our businesses become less and less competitive. The Liberals have driven job-creating businesses right out of Ontario into the arms of neighbouring states and provinces. Job creators like the Leamington Greenhouse operator who chose Delta, Ohio over Ontario to invest $61 million in his expanding business. And if this government doesn't reverse course on damaging policies, more and more businesses will follow suit. Speaker, how many more businesses have to leave Ontario before this government introduces Question. an incredible plan to make energy more affordable? Mr. Speaker, the member refers to the industrial rates or the business rates. Uh, the member must know, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the Ontario price is lower than probably 25 or 30 provinces and states in the U.S., Mr. Speaker. Those, that's the record, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Um, and uh, I want to say that I appreciate very much, Mr. Speaker. The member from Simcoe Gray is warned. Carry on. And Mr. Speaker, the member mentions going forward, what are we going to do? I appreciate that the Conservatives supported our refurbishment program, Mr. Speaker, because the next 30 years, they're going to put into this province electricity, which will cost about seven and a half to eight cents per kilowatt hour going into the grid, Mr. Speaker, and it'll be clean and emissions free. Answer. We did announce a couple of days ago $100 million that went into conservation wow. that will help reduce rates, Mr. Wow. Speaker, and there's much Thank more you. I'll say in the supplement. Thank you. Final supplementary. Dodge the question. The question is about prices today. And since you were elected, hydro costs have increased by more than $1,000 a year for the average family. This government has spent the last 12 years recklessly wasting billions of dollars on cancelled gas plants, expensive green energy experiments, and smart meters that were anything but smart. If they hadn't done all that, Hydro bills would be much more affordable, and the Auditor General has said as much in her last report. And without the waste on gas, cancel gas plants and smart meters, this government wouldn't have to resort. Minister of Finance is warned. Uh, excuse me, I'm not looking for any attention. Without that waste, you wouldn't have to resort to the fire sale of Hydro One. Speaker, will this government finally do something to address skyrocketing hydro bills for ratepayers? Will Thursday's budget, Mr. Finance Minister, include a credible plan to make energy Question. affordable in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think there's a lot of exaggeration coming from the other side. Ah. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the average daily price for electricity, if you take the, the price of electricity that's been paid in the province, the average by the residential is $5.26 per day, Mr. Speaker. That's less than most transit fares, return transit fares in the province of Ontario. Take public transit back and forth, Mr. Speaker. It costs less per day than what they're paying for electricity. There are one or two computers, one or two television sets, all their lights, Mr. Speaker. All of that, Mr. Speaker, is $5.26 per day. It's less than a return trip on any public transit system in Ontario. It's less than one go trip, one way go trip, Mr. Answer. Speaker. It is value that people are getting, and we're taking steps to bring it down, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do want to begin by, on behalf of uh, Ontario's New Democrats, welcoming the new member for Whitby Oshawa to the legislature. <laughs> speaker, people expect their government to work. This is to the Premier, Speaker. Uh, this, uh, this. Um, People expect this, their government to work for them and to invest in their priorities, Speaker, like supporting our children's schools and reducing wait times in our hospitals. But this government just doesn't seem to share those priorities, Speaker. For four straight budgets, the Liberals have chosen to freeze hospital funding. That's forced hospitals to cut millions of dollars from their budgets, close beds, fire thousands of nurses who provide frontline care to patients. People deserve to know, Speaker, how much 
deeper does this Premier want to cut health care services that people count on in this province? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party actually knows that we have increased funding to health care year over year, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, every single year. Since 2003, hospital funding has risen from $11.3 billion to $17.3 billion, yep. Mr. Speaker, a 53% increase, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and that has been every single year more money has gone into health care, Mr. Speaker. For small rural hospitals, we've invested over $17 million since 2003, Mr. Speaker. So just in terms of hospital funding alone, um, you can see the increases that we've made because we recognize how important those hospitals are to communities, how important health care is to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And you will see as we go forward, we will continue to increase investments yes, in health care across the province. Thank you. Well, Speaker, in public, the Premier promised to protect health care, but behind closed doors, she's cutting the care that we all rely on. Nearly 1,200 nursing jobs have been cut since the start of 2015 alone, Speaker, and hospitals say that they are now— Minister of Economic Development is warned. Carry on, please. And hospitals say that they are now at a critical turning point. Families know exactly what that means, Speaker. Longer wait times when our loved ones are sick, fewer nurses to provide critical care, fewer beds in our hospitals, more overcrowding, and even more worry for families and loved ones. How can this Premier keep cutting health care when she knows that those cuts are hurting Ontarians? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Speaker. I understand that it is somehow in the political interest of the third party to the third party leader to um, sow this kind of fear. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that I think it would be a much more productive discussion if the leader of the third party said, you know, we recognize that you're putting more funding into health care, but here's, here's the plan that we would like to see in place. Because yeah. the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we're hiring more nurses. She doesn't, the leader of the third party doesn't know as she talks about changes. She doesn't note that there is hiring going on at the same time, Mr. Speaker, as the, the other changes are taking place. She doesn't acknowledge that there are more health care workers being hired, Mr. Speaker, to work in the community, to work in hospitals, to work in health sciences centres. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, health care needs are growing Answer. as the population ages. The changes are needed in terms of delivery. We're making those changes. We're increasing funding. We will continue to do that. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. What I wish is that the Premier would actually start paying attention to what's happening to health care in Ontario. People are waiting months on end, Speaker, for the home care that they need. Thousands of seniors are stuck on waiting lists for long-term care in this province, Speaker. And the Premier's freeze on hospital budgets, which she cannot deny, she has frozen hospital budgets four years running, and those freezes, those, that freeze has forced hospitals to cut nearly 1,200 nursing jobs since the start of 2015. That's just the facts, Speaker. That's what this Premier needs to recognize, the facts. But the Premier is too focused, Speaker, on helping private investors profit off the sale of Hydro One to even notice that health care is suffering question. because of her Liberal cuts. It begs the question, how can this Premier actually think that profits for private investors are more important than patient care? Thank you. Well, I don't, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, I am very focused, as is our government, on helping people to deal with the challenge of their day-to-day -day lives, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is that there have been investments in community care. That that's the side of the story that the leader of the third party omits, as she talks about par a partial story, Mr. Speaker. The reality is demographics are changing. The reality is delivery of health care is changing, Mr. Speaker. And we need more investment in home care. And, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we continue to make those investments, we continue to increase funding, and we continue to hire health care workers across the province, Mr. Speaker, because we know that that kind of community care is what people need. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to discussing the budget after Thursday, and I hope that the leader of the, uh, the yes, third sir. party will then be able to comment on those further investments that we are making. Thank you.
New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, the Premier is failing miserably because she's actually making day-to-day -day life a lot worse for people. Uh, my next question, Speaker, is for the Premier. Protecting our hospitals and our children's schools is a priority for the people of Ontario, but the Premier just isn't listening to parents, students and education workers. The Liberals cut $250 million from education last year. They've shut down nearly 100 schools in four years, and now families are worried that Thursday's budget will bring even deeper cuts to Ontario schools. Why is this Premier cutting education when she knows that it's students that will pay the price? Thank you. Thank you. We're not cutting education funding, Mr. Speaker. Yes, in fact, we're increasing right. education funding. We have increased yes, education right. funding year over year. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, we have been doing that in the face of declining enrollment. Yep. So there are fewer students in the system, Mr. Speaker, but there is more funding in the system. And that means, Mr. Speaker, that there, is more, there are more resources in place for boards to yeah, deliver services. So, Mr. Speaker, yeah. we are seeing the results. The graduation rate in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I think is at 83 percent, 84 percent, Mr. Speaker, uh, after high school when we came into office. The graduation rate in this province was 68 percent, Mr. Shameful. Speaker. Yeah. Students have gotten more support. They have gotten resources that they need, Mr. Speaker, and that has allowed their achievement to improve. We will continue to work with uh, education leaders, Mr. Speaker, with parents. The Parent Reaching Out grants were announced last week, Mr. Speaker. That was a, a grassroots initiative. That Thank came you. from parents will continue. Thank you. Supplementary. The Liberals have already cut $250 million from education. That's the fact. And they've said that up to half a billion dollars could permanently be cut from schools by next year. Parents, trustees, and community advocates who are here today know exactly what those Liberal cuts mean to our schools. They lead to bigger class sizes, Speaker, a growing backlog of critical repairs to buildings, Speaker, broken heaters in the middle of winter, and even more school closures. People want an answer from this Premier Speaker. Why is she cutting education when she should be protecting our children's schools? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. First of all, let me repeat what the Premier said. We are not cutting education. The grants for student needs are 22.5 billion a couple of years ago. They are still 22.5 billion. But let me give you an idea where we have been investing money. In 2014, to keep schools in a good state of repair, the ministry announced an investment of 1.25 billion dollars for the school condition improvement over three years. And just to give you an idea, Speaker, the way that grant works is it's actually based on the facility condition index. We look at each board and customize the grant Answer. based on what condition is the grant is the uh, is are the schools in that board, and that's how we distribute the funding. And I'd be happy to give you some more information in the next question. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's like the Premier and the Liberals don't actually know what's going on in Ontario when it comes to education. They should look at their own last budget, which on page uh, 230 clearly states $250 million dollars coming out of education, Speaker. The Auditor General says that the Liberals have failed to keep up with urgent school repairs. And here's what that means, Speaker. When old heaters break, students are forced to wear their jackets in class just to stay warm. Ceilings leak in classrooms and libraries. And today, a quarter of the schools in Toronto are in critical condition and desperately need to be fixed. Yet this Premier is too focused on selling off Hydro One to even notice what's happening in our school, Speaker. When will this Premier start paying attention to the urgent Question. needs of students in our classrooms and stop her liberal cuts to education? Thank you. Minister. Yes, thank you. So, in, in addition to the school, uh, the school condition improvement fund I told you about, we also have the school renewal fund, which is three hundred and twenty-five million dollars. Three hundred and twenty-five million dollars this year. In fact, when you add up all the grants.
grants that have to do with school renewal, school retrofit. We actually spent $825 million on just that one area last year alone. And we've also said to the school boards, number one, we have $750 million school consolidation fund. And if you consolidate those schools with empty spaces, we'll help you. We'll help you do the renovation. We'll help you do the repair. We'll help you with the Answer. addition that you need. And we've also uh, directed the boards that if they sell a school, that they must invest the money in repairing the schools they can. Thank you. General reminder, I stand, you sit. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question this morning is for the Premier. More than 80 per cent of Ontarians opposed the sale of Hydro One. Yep. And two weeks ago, the voters of Whitby, Oshawa spoke loud and clear, sending this government a resounding message that they don't want the sell-off to continue. They don't want another skyrocketing hydro bill to pay for big raises at Hydro One. So, Speaker, will the Premier listen to the people of Whitby, Oshawa, and will she have her finance minister announce in the budget on Thursday that they won't be selling off any more Hydro One shares, or will she continue to insist that she knows more than the people of Ontario? Good question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, I, uh, I look forward to working with uh, the new member from Whitby, Oshawa. And, Mr. Speaker, I know from having listened to people in, uh, in Whitby, Oshawa, that a huge concern of the people in that riding uh, is about transportation and transportation yeah, infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Transit, transit infrastructure that needs investment. Uh, it's a community that wants that connectivity, Mr. Speaker, whether it's local infrastructure, whether it's uh, the road, Mr. Speaker, whether it's the Highway 407, or whether it is uh, transit and increased go service, Mr. Speaker. So the, the reality is that if we are going to make the investments that we know are necessary, not just in Whitby, Oshawa, but across the province, Mr. Speaker, we have Answer. to have the resources to do that. That's what the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One is about, Mr. Speaker, investing in that infrastructure Thank that's you. going to allow our economy to thrive. Thank you, Speaker. And it's clear from documents that were put before this House before Christmas that the money from Hydro One isn't going to infrastructure. And if the Premier was actually listening in Whitby, Oshawa, why would she waste Justin Trudeau's time in dragging him into an election that they were going to get resoundingly defeated in? Speaker, one small business in my riding recently received a bill for $27,000 for a vacant LCBO building. When they challenged the bill, Hydro One had to admit that it had no idea that the LCBO had moved out and they just continued to bill as if there was still an LCBO inside. Hydro One ended up settling instead of $27,000 for $3,600 after they actually looked at the meter reading. People have lost faith in Hydro One. They've lost faith in this Premier. They've lost faith in this government speaker. Will the Premier stop the further sell-off of Hydro One in this Thursday's budget? Thank you. Uh, the Premier passed it to the Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to uh, remind people that uh, the province still owns 84 per cent of Hydro One today, Mr. Here. Speaker. Uh, and I also want to uh, remind uh, members opposite, Mr. Speaker, that uh, of the proceeds uh, from, uh, from a partial sale of Hydro One shares, $5 billion is going to reduce provincial debt, Mr. Speaker. $4 billion is going into infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. And that's investment. Those are investments or pay down of debt that's not coming from taxes, or cutting programs, Mr. Speaker. It is a very, very smart fiscal management. Besides which, Mr. Sparker, Mr. Speaker, it is is a better managed company today, and it will become better as we go down the road, Mr. Speaker. They are making decisions now in this short time period that is adding value Answer. to shareholders, Mr. Speaker. And I must repeat uh, one more time, Mr. Speaker, that Hydro One does not control rates. They're controlled by the Ontario Energy Board. Thank so you. a better operating company. Thank you. New question, member from Windsor West. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Schools in this province are falling apart. Over the past five years alone, this government has underfunded school repairs by $5.8 billion. Add that to the previous repair backlog, and we now have a shortfall of $15 billion. That's billion, Speaker. Kids are being forced to wear winter coats inside because classrooms are 12 degrees. Roofs are collapsing, and children are being injured by broken infrastructure. While this government starves school boards of the resources they need to address these issues, students and families are being left behind. My question is simple. With a budget on the horizon, Ontario families want to know, will this government stop cuts to the classroom and commit to fixing the disrepair in our schools? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And uh, I, I'm pleased to report that, in fact, we have continued to increase education funding. If you look at the amount of funding that was received in 2003 and compare it today, yeah. it's up $8.1 billion. That's 56 percent at a time when the number of students have decreased. So a billion with a B. So the number so the amount per pupil has gone up the absolute amount has gone up the amount of funding for school renewal has gone up the amount of school for school renovations has gone up the amount of money for school repairs has gone up everything is going up and there they, and while there do continue to be schools that are not in a great shape we have actually fixed the funding model Thank you, Speaker. That just shows how out of touch the minister is because the needs of the students have increased, the cost of electricity has increased, and the cost of transportation has increased. Therefore, the budgets are not sufficient. Again to the minister, Ontario boasts highly qualified education and child care workers, bright students, and parents who want what's best for their children. This morning, organizations like Fix Our Schools, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, and the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care held a press conference at Queen's Park to demand answers. Directors of education, trustees, and students also attended. The Minister of Education needs to put our students first. Kids are paying the price for her misplaced priorities. This government must recognize that it's unacceptable that kids are wearing winter coats in classrooms. Will this government repair our schools and finally provide a safe and equal opportunity education for all Ontario students? Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you very much. It might interest you to know, because you, it, it sounds as if you don't actually realize this, that every year when we review the, uh, the operating funding for school boards, we we actually do increase the operating funding based on increases in utility costs so that in fact the school board funding is adjusted for increase in electricity and natural gas costs each year every year as they occur so that is factored into school board but it might also interest the people in the gallery to know that we've spent 13.9 billion to build 755 new schools in Ontario we have built in addition to that 720 renovations and major additions we have been significantly investing in our schools Thank you. and there's another Another 11 billion. Thank you. New question. The member from Beaches East York. Well, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Yeah. Now, Speaker, just last week our government made a very important announcement that will boost consumer convenience and choice in Ontario. And it seems only a few weeks ago that I stood third in line behind the Premier and the Finance Minister at the Leslie Street Loblaws as I purchased my first six pack of Molson Canadian and Steam Whistle beer. And now, last week, Speaker, we announced that in total, up to 300 grocery stores, both large chains and independents, will also now be selling wine. So by this fall, 70, 70 grocery stores will be authorized to have wine as well as fruit wine, beer, and cider being sold on their shelves. So, Speaker, will the minister please tell us about the great economic opportunities that this much-appreciated announcement will create? 
Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Beaches East York for the question and also for his advocacy on this matter. I know that he's been a champion for the beverage alcohol industry, and I thank him for his continued, continuous work. The changes will create a win-win-win outcome for the province's wine lovers, for Ontario's local domestic wine producers, and the farmers who support them, as well as for wines from all over the world. By selling wine in grocery stores will also help to boost economic growth and preserve jobs in Ontario's wine agricultural and tourism sectors. This will also help to maintain a vital source of economic growth and opportunity for the province's farm sector. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, cheers, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the minister for his answer and for this well-deserved and this well-received initiative. Because these changes really are a win-win-win for farmers, consumers, and retailers in Ontario. And I'm particularly pleased about the fact that as part of these changes, cider and fruit wines will also now be available in grocery stores. I know that Ontario's producers in these emerging categories, cider of course being the fastest growing segment at the LCBO, and I'm excited to await the successes that they will achieve when afforded wider market access. So, Speaker, will the minister share with this House how also this government will benefit the Ontario consumers by these changes? Thank you, Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, I'd like to thank the member for the question and for the cheers. I appreciate that. I, too, share the excitement for the potential growth for cider producers in Ontario with these changes. As we've announced, wine and beer producers will benefit greatly from this change, uh, along with craft brewers and distillers. Craft distillers are important here as well. They will now be able to deliver directly to restaurants and bars, a change they have long advocated for, and they will also now receive better-selling commissions on that and their on-site stores. All of these changes are taking place while our government maintains our strong commitment to social responsibility wherever beverage alcohol is sold. Here. Thank you. A new question, the member from Halliburton, Fourth Lakes Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My precious yeah. Minister of Energy, we have continuously demanded that the Liberal government do something to address the damage resulting from their disastrous energy policies. Policies that have driven the price of electricity from 4.3 cents per kilowatt hour to 17.5 cents on peak. They're driving people into poverty just to pay off their hydro bills. And what do we get from this government? They continuously make excuses, put new packaging around shell games, confuse taxpayers, yep. ratepayers even more. So the bottom line is, when people pick up their hydro bills, they see them continuing to rise at alarming rates. Yep. It's not only hurting ratepayers, it's seriously damaging our economy. So, Speaker, will the minister commit Question. to a credible plan to bring in affordable energy rates in this year's budget? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, I might remind the member that uh, just several days ago, Mr. Speaker, we announced $100 million to assist people, 36,000 people in this province, to reduce their energy bill, Mr. Speaker. And I might remind the member as well that that party supported us with the nu nuclear refurbishment projects that we just announced several months ago, Mr. Speaker, which will show electricity going into the grid at seven and a half to eight cents per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. It's a very, very major initiative, and the National Energy Board projects our our increase in electricity prices over the next 16 years for residential owners to be 1.7 percent, Mr. Speaker, which is around the rate of inflation or less because of the investments and the decisions that we're making in the system today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have more people in poverty than ever before. It's because of their hydro rates. So don't need more stories and excuses. The first thing the government needs to do is stop doing what you have been doing, because it's clearly not working. With rates four times higher than when you came into office, you have a scathing Auditor General's report which shows that consumers are paying $37 billion wow. more than they should have paid. Shameful. It clearly highlights there needs to be a policy reversal. So thanks for the $100 million, but you've already overcharged them $37 billion. <laughs> so will the minister commit today to create 
an energy plan that's credible and will bring affordable energy rates and stop signing those exorbitant contracts of unreliable energy that are continuing to drive up hydro rates even further. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that's happening to reduce rates uh, is a conservation program at Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. They've initiated a project which is saving those who participate, Mr. Speaker, particularly in the rural areas, between $800 and $1,200 a year. It's a heat pump program, Mr. Speaker, where they subsidize the installation of the heat pump. And the record in Nova Scotia and now in Ontario with the program that they've started, it's saving customers between $800 and $1,200 a year, Mr. Speaker. That's something that's really, really concrete. In addition to the $100 million we just invested for retrofits, Mr. Speaker, in the province. We are taking very significant action in many different ways, Mr. Speaker, and I would, I would challenge the member to come to my office for a briefing on all of the things that we're doing for the electricity sector, Mr. Speaker, and perhaps yes, then the questions will be more informed. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, people don't want money from a cap-and-trade program to be used as a Liberal Party slush fund. They might want to see this money is actually tackling climate change, helping families to reduce their carbon footprint and to save money. And yet the government announced several spending programs recently, including a $3,000 rebate on a $150,000 electric car, without showing how much greenhouse gases would be reduced by the program, if any. Will these spending programs include transparent, evidence-based projections showing that they will actually help families in the climate rather than just the Liberal Party of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, and I, I'll, I'll take that as support from the member opposite for the initiatives. The entire dynamic about how we measure GHGs, your point's well taken. That that will be part of the five-year action plan. These are programs, Mr. Speaker, the electric vehicle program the, run by my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Transportation, uh, uh, who's provided extraordinary leadership, brings down the cost of an electric vehicle to being extraordinarily affordable. In some cases, like if you're buying the Chevy Spark, it's a few thousand dollars. It actually means that for seniors and for families, and it also means with an electric vehicle, Mr. Speaker, that this is creating a lot of jobs, opening up our ability to attract more investment in the electric sector and uh, making lives much more affordable. The same thing with our social housing and the retrofit programs. And sir, energy is running. These are good news stories. They help make life more affordable. They create jobs, and it's good news, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, we've seen the Liberals have fun with numbers before. The government created the Trillium Trust as a dedicated fund for infrastructure in 2014, but then dissolved the fund as a special purpose account just one year later. The only way we can be sure that cap and trade money won't be used as a slush fund is to keep the money separate. The Canadian Environmental Law Association recommends that revenue from a cap-and-trade program flow into a separate and transparent special-purpose account and not into general government revenue. Will the government keep cap-and-trade funds separate so their use is transparent? Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I we, you don't get much more transparent than $325 million in specific allocations announced by the President of Treasury Board. Uh, each one of those programs is being run, in most cases, by a third party, the Canadian Manufacturers Exporters Association and other partner organizations. They submit and they account for directly that funding, and you can't get much more transparent than that. Mr. Speaker, you'll see when the climate change legislation, because I know the NDP is very good at spending money, we'll find out in the next week or two whether they'll actually support a price on pollution, which I hope they will, and if they'll support a price on pollution, you will see the accounting exercise being very, very clear. We have have to meet the same standards as Quebec and California under the Western Climate Initiative, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and a third-party review by the Compact of Regions that we're actually making progress, Mr. Speaker. There isn't a jurisdiction that's being held to a higher standard than we are, Mr. Speaker. The question, the member from Barry. 
Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to direct my question to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Last month, Ontario gained nearly 20,000 net new jobs, which adds to a long line of months of growth of jobs in this province. In fact, I understand that in the last two months alone, Ontario has gained a net of 50,000 jobs. While it sounds like steady growth, I recently heard the Leader of the Opposition on CP24 insinuating that Ontario is actually losing jobs. Shame. If the Leader of the Opposition is incorrect in that statement, I'm concerned that Ontarians may not be getting the straight facts on the strength of Ontario's economic growth. I would certainly, I would certainly encourage all legislators to refrain from talking Question. Ontario's economy down and instead act in effect. Minister, please advise this House on how Thank Ontario you. is doing in attracting investment. Uh, employment and infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very pleased to confirm to the member that Ontario's economy continues to grow. Ontarians are being inundated, however, with economic news about challenges in the overall Canadian economy. Whoops. Whoops. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Please finish. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the the, uh, the, t the uh, national news often is inundated with tough times that are taking place in our sister province in, in Alberta. The fact that Ontario's economic performance has been much stronger than the national picture and is trending in a much more positive direction can sometimes get lost, Mr. Speaker, in that national coverage. Ontario continues to lead this country in growth and yes, in sir. job creation. Here are the facts, Mr. Speaker, not according to me, but to Stats Canada. Since 2009, Ontario has gained 680. 8,300 new jobs. What? Thank you. Supplementary. I'm pleased to hear that overall of Ontario's economy continues to be on the upswing. That's good news for Ontario workers and for families all across this province. Many of us will be joining our municipal partners later today at the Ontario Good Roads Association Roma Conference. While Ontario is excelling in job creation overall, I know some regions of the province are still struggling. Some parts of the province were hit harder by global recession than others and still need some support to enjoy the overall level of growth experienced province-wide. As well, our manufacturing sector is still transitioning to global initiatives. Can the minister share with this legislature some of the measures he is taking to drive regional economic growth and growth in manufacturing? Thank you, Minister. What an important and timely question, Mr. Speaker. While Ontario has led North America for two years in a row in attracting foreign direct investment, we continue to lead Canada in job creation and growth. The fact is, though, some regions of our province were hit harder by the global recession than others, and some are still struggling. That's why we ignored the advice of the opposition and took the advice of our local municipal partners when we established our regional economic development funds. We've invested $170 million through our regional economic development funds, which has leveraged $1.8 billion in private sector investment and has created or supported over 41,000 jobs in eastern and southwestern Ontario. The vast majority of those investments, Mr. Speaker, are in manufacturing. In fact, Mr. Speaker, over the last 12 months alone, 15,000 net new manufacturing jobs added to this province. Mr. Speaker, we're not done. We have more work to do, but Thank we're going you. to continue to diligently invest in these programs. Your question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Questions for the Minister of Finance. Uh, this is, week is the start of the Rural Ontario and Municipal Association annual conference. You may remember the Premier's speech in, in 2015 where she promised, quote, we will reform the provincial land tax. We will bring forward proposals that can be implemented this year, close quote. Well, Minister, it's been a year and still silence from your government. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. When will the Minister finance table reforms that will find a meaningful solution for both municipalities and Ontarians living in unorganized territories? Or is this just another stretch goal? Oh. 
Well, thank you for the question. I appreciate the concern because it's something that we all share, recognizing the impact it has on municipalities. We also understand the, uh, the issue with regards to uh, unincorporated lands and unincorporated properties uh, and regions around those respective municipalities. Those consultations have has been undergoing and has been proceeding, and we recognize that those neighboring municipalities want a component share of that. The Premier made that commitment. We are working with that, and in the upcoming budget, we'll have more to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister Finance, this is an issue that requires real leadership and a real commitment to the people of Northern Ontario, yes. both unorganized territories and in municipalities. Because of this Liberal government's cuts to the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund, Northern municipalities need financial assistance now more than ever. And the minister promised to help, but now he's nowhere to be found. Mr. Speaker, when the Minister of Finance speaks to the rural and northern mayors at the Minister's Forum later today, will he apologize for breaking yet another promise? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we uh, made a commitment to actually provide Mr. Powell with $505 million in unconditional funding through the uh, OMPF. Uh, that uh, OMPF combined with the municipal benefit results uh, from the provincial uploads totals $2.3 billion in 2016, nearly four times the level of funding provided in 2004. Uh, this is the equivalent of 13 percent of municipal property tax revenue in the province. The member knows uh, perfectly well that the OMPF has been revised, but that support for those uh, communities is continuing. And Frankly, it was a result of the, of the, the uploads and, and the downloading of the previous governments that created a lot of havoc and a lot of stress in the system. We've uploaded. We're providing support. There's net benefits going to those municipalities. They'll continue. They have our support, Answer. and much more will be said in the budget that's going to provide them with a great degree of support. And we hope we can count on your support you. for them as a result. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, this government has created two worlds in Ontario. There's one world where the rest of us live in, and there's the other world where the wow. Liberal government and their powerful lobbyists live in, ah. like the auto insurance industry, which currently enjoys record profits at the same time where Ontarians pay the highest auto insurance premiums in the entire country. Now, the government was pushed by New Democrats in 2013 to reduce auto insurance premiums by 15 percent. The government responded and said they would complete this promise within two years. Well, over that timeline is, is long gone, and this government hasn't even achieved half of that promise. In response, the Premier has said, oh, that was simply a stretch goal, oh. something they never intended of completing anyways. Question. The timeline has passed. The Liberals have broken their promise. New Democrats, new, new Democrats call this stretch goal a broken promise. How can Ontario trust you. this government to fulfill any commitment? Thank you. Senior. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I appreciate the question, and, and I remind the member opposite that had we proceeded with the work we did on time and as scheduled, some of that benefit would be had now. But because of the delays and the obstructions by the members opposite, we've now had to provide for legislation that was later than expected. The fact of the matter is insurance rates are going down, not up. And many uh, uh, insurance companies, because it's a competitive industry, have already started to, re to provide 15 percent reductions in their, in their insurance premiums. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, it's not at a point in time that matters most. It's on an ongoing basis to ensure that there's a structural change in the system to provide for lower costs of claims and better benefit for the uh, 9.5 million drivers that exist. Mr. Speaker, we're doing our job. We hope we can count on their support Answer. going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear. This government, this Liberal government, this Premier have the power and the ability to reduce auto insurance premiums, but they won't because it's not a priority for this government. The, the government has made it clear that they're continuing to break promise after promise, but the Premier likes to call those simply stretch goals, promises that they make but they never intend to completing anyways. In the upcoming budget, Ontarians want to see some real commitments. They want to see investments in health care. They want to see commitments to ensure that we have good paying permanent jobs in this province. They want to see affordable auto insurance rates, and they don't want to see continual slashing and cutting of our benefits. They want to see investment that actually builds transit in this province. but. 
They know better than to trust this government. They know that this government is going to just make more stretch goals. So my question is simple, Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker. What other stretch goals can we look forward to in this upcoming budget? Question. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, Ontario currently has and will continue to have the most generous of, uh, of benefits anywhere in the country. That will continue. The member opposite is well aware that a number of changes are being proposed in terms of making the processing of claims more efficient, to, to provide greater benefit to the victims and those that are in need, and to enable more affordability and more efficiency in the system. Those are the proposed changes that we're making, as well as anti-fraud measures and other things that enables the system to be less expensive. We put those changes in place. They delayed them, and now we're trying to still catch up as a result of those delays. We're getting there, Mr. Speaker. Many of these companies are competitive. They are providing for lower rates, and they'll continue to do so, provided the member opposite doesn't obstruct them any further. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. I was pleased when the minister introduced the Supporting Ontario's First Responders Act. First responders are at risk of PTSD due to the traumatic situations that they have to engage in and the accumulative effect of experiencing these traumatic events. For example, during a shift as a nurse in the emergency room at Cambridge Hospital, a child came in with no vital signs from a car crash. A police officer guided the stretcher, and a paramedic and firefighter performed CPR. We couldn't save him. They were very upset but had to attend to other incidents that shift. The same paramedics attended several other traumatic events during the next week. With no supports to help them cope, one paramedic was later diagnosed with PTSD. She was delayed in getting WSIB, hampering her recovery. Can the minister please inform the House Question. what this legislation entails and the significance it will have if passed? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for a question and for the interest of all members of the House in this very important topic. Last Thursday, I introduced the Supporting Ontario's First Responders Act. Now, I know that all members in this House recognize that post-traumatic stress disorder is a very significant risk to the health and to the well-being of first responders in this province. Physical injuries, Speaker, we can spot pretty clearly. Psychological in injuries take a lot more. So if passed by the House, this bill is going to create a presumption that PTSD diagnosed in first responders is a result of the workers' employment. Their claims to the WSIB will be automatically approved after that, Speaker. This, this will provide for immediate identification of the issue, immediate intervention, Answer. immediate treatment for the first responders. Speaker, I'm very proud of this bill. I hope it gets the support yeah, yeah, yeah. of the entire House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. I know he has worked hard to advocate for our first responders, and some of them, including some firefighters from my community of Cambridge, came to Queen's Park to show their support when the minister announced the proposed legislation. These changes, if passed, would make a big difference in the lives of dedicated professionals who experience traumatic events in the course of their work. This legislation supports those who are already suffering from PTSD. I know that this government has emphasized a comprehensive plan that supports cultural change to overcome stigma, provides the mental tools necessary to respond to events and build resiliency, as well as to help prevent PTSD from occurring in the first place. Can the minister Question. please share with the House the prevention pieces of this comprehensive PTSD strategy for our first responders? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. That is an excellent question because it points out that we need a comprehensive strategy on this. That while it's important that the bill pass, that the uh, the uh, legislation in the House pass, it's also important that we have preventative legislation, preventative programs in this in this uh, regard. So with the full support of the Premier, I brought forward what I think is a comprehensive plan that addresses the legislative portion that also addresses the prevention portion. Four prevention initiatives. We're going to have an awareness campaign. You'll be hearing on the radio very soon, Speaker. A leadership summit that first responders want to see duplicated. The success we had last year, 
an online toolkit for all employers in this province so that you can come from the smallest municipality, you have access to the same information Answer. as the City of Toronto. Speaker, there's more research emerging on this issue. Ontario is going to stay on top of that research. We're going to be a leader in this regard. My question, the member from Central Grid. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is uh, for the uh, Premier. A few days ago, the uh, province uh, approved the uh, WPD wind turbine project in my riding of Simcoe Grey. This project will result in eight 500 foot wind turbines placed literally right next door to the Collingwood Regional Airport. So the municipalities in my riding don't want this project, as I've said several times in this House. The people of my riding aren't in favour of it either. The municipalities have done a study that shows the turbines will hurt the local economy and future investment at the airport. Furthermore, this project endangers pilots and public safety. The towers will be the tallest structures in all of rural Ontario throughout Canada. They're as tall as the TD office tower shame. in downtown Toronto. Mr. Speaker, given all these points, can the Premier tell us why her government is ignoring the safety of the Question. people of Simcoe Gray? Canada's pilots and the local municipalities in allowing this project to proceed. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you. I, I thank the honourable member for his question, Mr. Speaker. We've had this conversation a few times. As he knows, in this case, we took extraordinary measures to consult. Adding, adding, well, add, and, well, maybe they don't know this, Mr. Speaker, but. Extending our standard six, Mr. Speaker, I can't even hear myself. Never mind the opposition. I, um, we add. No. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We had a uh, we added to uh, six months to the standard review over two years. We considered over 350 public and agency comments and and, and, and looked at the Answer. economic side. But Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear about this. NAB Canada, not on once, not on two times, on three times, reviewed this, and they set the standards for air navigation, and they Thank found you. no problem with it, Mr. Speaker. So, stop. Thank you. The member from Prince Edward Hastings, although albeit late, is warned. Uh, but there's always time for another one. Supplementary fifteen. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've heard this gibberish from the minister before. He doesn't know what the heck he's talking about on this issue. NAVCAN told me a year and a half ago, the Deputy Minister of Transportation, that they didn't have any rules for this sort of situation because they didn't think any government would be stupid enough to build eight 500-foot wind turbines close to a regional hospital airport. So they don't have any rules. I hope you're aware you're the only government in Canada that took away local power to plan. You have changed the planning act. Everybody else, when they have this situation, can say, move your towers. They can't do that in Ontario. And you've ignored everything you've heard on this issue, and you keep hiding behind NAV Canada. And NAV Canada told you, don't put the towers there. We don't have any rules to protect you. Their advice here is, if it gets really bad, close the airport. If it gets bad enough, change your runways. Move your runways. Thank you. We are expecting tens of millions of dollars to invest in stock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's, let's just review this carefully. On January 5, 2016, NAV Canada gave their first opinion, saying that the Fairboat project will have minimal impact on the current or future operations of the CRA. On January 7, Transport Canada said the same thing, and on January 14, NAV Canada again provided their comments based on the town's analysis that this is not interfering with their uh, requirements. Now, Mr. Speaker, we had his party in power federally, and this is a federally regulated standard. 
We appealed to the federal minister to review it. She did not return my phone calls, Mr. Speaker. Maybe, maybe the minister maybe office had the call. same luck. But this is within NAV Canada standards and guidelines. It is not a provincial responsibility. Answer. And finally, Mr. Speaker, it is not my decision. It is a decision of the director of a public servant. And the member suggesting I politicize it by inserting myself Thank improperly you. and illegally in the decision. Thank you. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.